These mangroves fringe the inlet Warneet, one of the largest of many such inlets on Western Port Bay. The boats moored here indicate one of the reasons for the importance of Western Port. It is a major recreation resource for the people of Melbourne for swimming, boating and fishing. My name is Grant Hazelgrove. I work for an organisation called the Western Port Catchment Coordinating Group. We in the group try to draw together the many activities and the uses of resources in the catchment that have an impact on the bay. The Western Port catchment is important not only for recreation, there is also agriculture here and industrial and residential development. Western Port is located on the southern coast of Victoria near the city of Melbourne and its use is closely linked to the needs of the people of that city. In 1973, a major environmental study was carried out. This resulted from the outcry over possible industrial development. The environmental study sought to gain information so as to assist in decisions concerning the use of the resources in Western Port. Western Port has a variety of resources and there's a complex interrelationship between land and sea. Management of water resources shows the relationship between things within the catchment and also the relationship between the catchments and the needs of metropolitan Melbourne. Walking alongside this pleasant stream it might be difficult to understand the connection between this stream environment and Western Port itself. But it is important to maintain the water quality in these streams, not only for the creatures that live within the streams, but because the water eventually finds its way into the bay. Within the catchment are two major water storages. This vast expanse of water here is the Cadinia Reservoir. The water for this is collected from outside the catchment and it is used to supply the Melbourne water supply. Tarrigo, on the other hand, collects its water from within the catchment and is used mainly to supply townships on the Mornington Peninsula and the industrial area around Hastings. Some small townships are supplied with water taken from this aqueduct which runs the water to the Mornington Peninsula. One of the major activities in the catchment is agriculture. Over 70% of the land is used for that purpose. Social and economic trends, however, are influencing the way land is being used. Farming now requires greater and greater investments of capital to be economically viable. As well, there is increased competition for the land from people wanting to set up hobby farms or simply to live on a few hectares in the country. There's sheep and cattle grazing here, including about 10% of the state's dairy herd. One of the dairy farmers in the area is Graham Painter, who has a farm near Druin. Some of the best uh, dairy country around this region? Oh, well, the flats are. The hills aren't as good as some of the uh, Cooey Rupp Swamp area. Mm -hmm. You've been dairy farming here, I understand, for what, 15, 20 years or so? Oh, around 15 on this place, but uh, I've been dairying in the district all my life. Have you seen any changes, uh, say, in the last 15 years? Oh, of course, um, dairy farm sizes have grown and herd sizes have grown mm -hmm. considerably in that time. I remember uh, my father used to milk 65 and 70 cows and he raised a family and that had a good living. But uh, we're looking now at probably 120 cows for a family farm. And even then, uh, cost pressures all the time are forcing us uh, to go either to bigger and bigger units or to go into off-farm income as a sideline. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. If you say you're going to milk 120 cows in this sort of country, what sort of acreage would you be looking at? Oh, you, you've got to be on a 160 acre farm around about to uh, do any good at all these days. With your stock and plants, you're probably two hundred and twenty or thirty thousand dollars to get going in dairying in this area. Well, what, what, what's uh, forced the, the land prices up, say, in this region around here? Oh, proximity to uh, the city, I think, would be the major thing. And also the fact that it's such a nice place to live. It's naturally attractive and we're getting people from the city are coming out to live amongst us. If you want to buy, you, you're competing against them. Or if you say, for instance, uh, you wanted to expand your operation, then you're really competing against people who might, say, want to have a hobby farm or uh, just some form of rural residence. Uh, yes, that's uh, not my particular case. I have some hobby farms near me. But in a number of farmers' cases, they're completely locked in by hobby farms. Their units are economic, and they're probably going to need to sell and move to another area. Uh, if they want to stay far. I guess the whole thing's tied up in uh, the fact that if a farmer wants to sell, uh, then another farmer can't buy it and make his place a viable unit if he's okay. competing with, uh, uh, say, a city business person with, uh, uh, who, who likes to put a value on living in the particular area and can afford to live there without uh, reaping a return on that investment. I see. Whereas the dairy farmer's got to get a uh, specific return on his capital. Oh, well, uh, dairying these days is a business. It's um, not just a way of life as it used to be, and uh, the pressures are so great that if it's not a business, you're going to go to the wall. Mm. You know, I sympathise with the people coming out. I've got nothing against the hobby farmers themselves. If I lived in the city, I'd be breaking my neck to come and live in the country too. Uh, so that I, I don't oppose the principle. In fact, I defend the right of people who want to come out and live in the country. Uh, but I, I can see that in Australia's future interest for uh, self-sufficiency in food, food production, that uh, we don't necessarily want to see all of our good dairying land covered up with houses. Yes, and this is some excellent dairying country around here. A considerable part of the land near the top of the bay that is now used for agriculture was once swampland, covered with dense giant tea tree. These swamps were practically impenetrable and for a long time a barrier to the development of the region. Now it is an important market gardening area and only a few pockets of the former swamp remain. Drainage work started in the 1870s when the Bunyip River was straightened and extended to the sea. Further drains have been created and the main drain has been deepened and widened and the height of its banks increased to counteract flooding. Over the years the use of these drained lands has varied. This cheese factory is a relic of the days when there was much more daring in the area. Communities and ways of life have come and gone reflecting changes in the economics of agriculture. Holdings have increased in size over the years and the area is ideal for market gardening because it is close to Melbourne and the soil is an extremely rich black peaty soil. These vegetable growing operations are highly mechanised and a variety of crops are grown. These include potatoes, asparagus, broccoli and peas. With the advent of irrigation, yields have risen dramatically. But irrigation depends on a reliable source of water. The problem now is no longer to drain the swamp the demand is now for a guaranteed supply of good water. Much of the water used is obtained by sinking bores to tap the aquifer, the underground water. This is a valuable resource which must be carefully managed. As well, large dams are used to hold water which is collected during winter and spring from the many drains that run throughout the area. 
tests carried out by the Department of Minerals and Energy constantly monitor the condition of the underground water in order to give information so that water usage can be controlled. One danger is that if too much water is drawn from the aquifer, salt water will intrude from the sea. The immediate needs of the farmers must be balanced against the long-term preservation of the resource. I visited John Burrup, a market gardener in the Delmore area. Richard Lakey, who works with the Department of Minerals and Energy, was also present. I must compliment you on your carrots, John. Yes, they're rather nice flavour, aren't they? God, that soil's sticky. Yes, it... Uh, How on earth do you work sticky. it? I mean, when it gets wet, it must be almost impossible. Hello, John. Fun. Hello, Grant. See, the water in your big dam's pretty low. <clears throat> yes, it's uh, pretty well down. We try and work things that way at the end of the year so that we have a maximum capacity we can draw from the drain in winter time to save the underground resources you get much as possible. You get much, most of your water from the drain or do you, are you fairly dependent upon the underground uh, resource? We're more dependent on the underground really if it's a long irrigation season. Uh, normally we draw possibly 50-50. I notice that, uh, and I understand that in about the last 10, 12 years or so, in fact there's been extensive uh, use of irrigation in this area. Has this created any problems? hasn't actually created any problems but it is a very intensive irrigation area now and uh, it is drawing a lot of underground water. Can the system uh, take uh, this heavy load on the uh, underground resources Richard? Prior to 1958 very little actual development had occurred in the area. There were a few relatively shallow stock and domestic bores but no significant extraction for irrigation purposes. Between 58 and 68 large-scale development took place particularly in this Delmore area and up towards Coralin and uh, in consequence in 1968 extractions during a drought year uh, affected the groundwater levels across the basin to the extent that restrictions had to be brought in. That brought the matter to a head and precipitated a large-scale investigation and as a result of that investigation um, no further licenses have been issued in this particular area which is the most affected zone. Um, one of the threats to the resource in its present state of overdevelopment is saline intrusion and that aspect has to be resolved before the resource is further committed. John, I understand that this this soil that I'm looking at here, in fact, is about perhaps the finest soil on the swamp itself in this general area around here. I would have to agree with that, Grant. Uh, being right in the middle of it to start with, but uh, there may be some further up that may dispute that poss possibly, but I don't think there's any doubt that the, this black soil stands on its record. Unfortunately, uh, although the soils are uh, here, this is not the most favourable part of the basin for groundwater development and we'd like to see a more uniform development of the groundwater resource across the basin rather than this concentrated um, high density bore development in this relatively small area with unfortunately the attendant undesirable um, consequences such as the saline intrusion threat. The draining of the swamp radically altered the landscape and produce some considerable benefits, but also produce some continuing adverse effects. Originally, the Bunyip and Lang Lang rivers did not run to the sea, they drained into the swamp. These man-made extensions of the rivers to the sea has meant that the river banks and beds have eroded and great quantities of sediment are carried into Western Port Bay. Some of the effects of this can be seen near this jetty at Lang Lang. The water is extremely turbid and the sediment sets up a destructive cycle in the ecology of the bay. The sediment kills grass on the mud flats, leaving the flats exposed to the action of tides and waves. 